been a sufficient term. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, across the board, really, I guess it probably this is the case for the texts we've already read. Maybe I'll share my screen now. So the title of the series, as you have observed, this Cyber Semiotics Culture Research Unit is a direct reference to the Cybernetics Culture Research Unit that was founded in Warwick uh, by Nick Land and by, by some others, by Sadie Plant also, for example. Sadie Plant, I think, is the author of this uh, gender accelerationism text uh, that we read. And also the CS in the CCRU is meant to include cyber semiotics rather than just cybernetics and reasonings for that, I guess, were made clear by Josh last week, perhaps. What does the cybernetic approach miss that semiotics, biosemiotics, cognitive semiotics, or cyber semiotics may, may be able to capture? But it cuts both ways. I would say that in the, in the picture of bio and cyber and cognitive semiotics, they're also lacking the tools of post-structuralism, for lack of a better term. And these tools, these deconstructive tools, uh, sometimes, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, were well understood by the cybernetics culture research unit. That is by land and and by plant. And I so I think people like Greer and uh, other major figures in those areas uh, maybe unduly neglect these these tools. And that's why I kind of foreground. Uh, and and in this case, I'm foregrounding foregrounding the most extreme of all possible examples of these tools even though perhaps they're not the most exemplary of the semiotic approach, as I'll, as I'll explain, probably the semiotic approach is something more, more neutral, or at least it would presume to be. And here's the Moodle, here's the schedule. Some small changes have been made. Here we are. Uh, so a slight change to the plan. For, for next week, you can see it's going to be a movie night. This was my idea. We're going to watch The Social Network, which is like chauvinistic Hollywood trash. Uh, it'll be great. And, and, and I'll say more about it at the end of the lecture today. But it'll be online. Yeah. I'm sure you've all seen it. It's worth rewatching. I'll tell you what. And it's also, uh, well, today's talk, I should say, is a little teaser in, in a way for for my talk upcoming at Semios Law, which will be on April 18th. First time I've given a talk at Semios Law since 2020. Maybe it was 2021. And and, and that, that talk was titled uh, Alphabet, Goddess, and Schizoanalysis. And so this is going to be like part two, alphabet versus the goddess part two. Don't miss it. Yeah. And so tonight's, or well, today is, is a little teaser for that. That talk will be longer. This one's going to be short as usual. You know, one of the interesting, I guess one of the hooks of, of Sadie's article, Sadie Plant's article, if it is indeed written by Sadie Plant, is uh, this little brief history of computer science that starts with, I'm no expert in computer science. I, I wonder actually if any of our people in our group know enough about computer science to say something about how accurate this portrayal is that she gives. If so, you can chime in uh, uh, after, after my lecture. The picture she portrays is that MIT and the birth of at the birth of computer science proper and, and, and programming, there was an attempt uh, to centralize control of, of the development of, of programming, uh, corporate control effectively between IBM and several other companies, uh, and a think tank at MIT that was a kind of hybrid think tank, of course, as all hacker think tanks are, 
difficult to control, but the program that they, their attempt to control or to impose a kind of uh, tree-like or like uh, top-down uh, hierarchical structure on the internet in its birth was called multics. That's what they call it. That's what they called it, multics, according to Plant. And so the castration of multics is the story of the defeat of this attempt to control the internet by the corporations. And this is the birth of uh, what was first called Unix, uh, the castrated, yes, or, you know, the penisless, and then Unix, I guess, for branding purposes, they decided to change it. And then later known as Linux, I guess, claim uh, from plant is that Linux won. Uh, Android is on Linux, everything's on Linux, you know. Strong claim, I think, yeah, from plant. Uh, a further claim, of course, the crucial claim, well, how is how it's connected to gender. She says that this innovation and the development in the history of computer science is kind of parallels, but also accelerates a uh, process in the elimination of the male sex. And she says, perhaps it's no surprise then that as the erosion of metaphysical masculine power becomes realized materially at the forefront of acceleration, it coincides with the little, literal erosion of the male sex. We can understand metaphysical masculine power in terms of the like uh, tree-like uh, hierarchical character, top-down hierarchical, and uh, single single origin control, also, or attempt to impose single single origin organization and top-down control of the, of the. This is what she thinks of as a masculine masculine principle. So there are some extreme positions here, though. Well, I'll be, I will certainly say that from the perspective of general semiotics and the International Semi Semiotics Institute, we certainly have something to learn from gender acceleration. I think particularly, uh, particularly their emphasis on uh, open software movement, of course, and software, obviously, obviously, which I've tried to emphasize in my principles, which have, have been met with some resistance. You can see the open software movement probably falls under principle number four which I've labeled at this point, I'm labeling not-for-profit public access. Previously, I called it uh, uh, open access. I received some pushback because of the way that open access as a platform has been appropriated by, let's say, by the state apparatus, you know, as Deleuze and Guattari would call it, would call it and become a, a platform for making profit. That is the, op the opposite of its original intention. And uh, perhaps, you know, again, on this point, I don't know much about uh, open source, open software movement, that is. Uh, and its current state, uh, how successful it still is, and you know, how radical, and whether it's been appropriated, whether open software itself is now TM, you know, like a uh, brand trademark or something, probably. But anyway, probably, I don't know. Let's just take Sadie's word for it. Probably this is uh, still accurate. It was written in 2018, so not that long ago. But written here in the highlighted section is the Project GNU, or perhaps it's GN News license. The GNU general public license was itself an extremely innovative contribution to free software because it carries with it the bargain that while any source code licensed under it can be copied and modified without restriction, every copy or modification must itself be licensed under the GPL. The GPL, in other words, is a virus that spreads itself not through computers, but through us. say this, uh, the, the way that this principle of uh, open software uh, relates to the third principle also regarding multipolarity. And this is another reason why it's important, why we might adopt it, why we might learn something from gender acceleration here, because they seem to perceive this connection between open software and multipolarity. And this is emphasized in the second part of the quote. The CIA themselves admit in the Vault 7 leaks on the issue of the literal weaponization of software that cyber weapons are not possible to keep under effective control. In other words, a second great castration is unfolding. Obviously, Snowden and, and WikiLeaks are just anticipations of this. Mostly of what is yet to come, yeah. Well, but with Haraway, uh, it would seem 
um, that plant seems to endorse a vision of the online experience as some kind of uh, freed plenitude of, of the feminine uh, space in which rhizomatic uh, smooth, smooth, smooth space may be articulated against the state apparatus and against the phallus of the, uh, the phallogocentric matrix as, as she understands it against chauvinistic patriarchy, yes, that the online space is the space of, of real guerrilla warfare. She, she maintains it, and so she, with this, uh, with in this, she is in uh, one with Haraway, it seems. And very much, well, very not at one with, with Cupid, who would paint the picture somewhat otherwise. And so I would I simply pose the question to, to y'all in, in the audience, an honest question about, about the online, your personal online experience. Does your online experience uh, uh, reproduce the free rhizomatic feminine, feminine and space of, of, of guerrilla warfare for you? Nor is it rather something closer to what Cupid portray, portrays as something still quite phallogocentric that is still controlled by the corporations. But we, we certainly will side, side with Haraway and, and um, uh, and plant on in the observation that we must at least acknowledge the radical potentiality of the online space and not, and not deny and not deny that that radical potentiality because as you'll see in, as as we've seen already and and writers like Hubert and others uh, it is a common tendency to kind of dismiss out of hand any radical potentiality of the online. For example, Hubert told us Hubert told us that the online well whatever satisfies. Her, Whatever desires are satisfied by the online experience are, according to Cupid, ones that are manufactured, artificial desires, he says, that are getting in the way of the original, perhaps organic desires that we should be should be enjoying. And I was, well, who are you, Mr. Cupid, to tell me which of my desires are artificial and, and which are not? But anyway, I have this cool diagram. I don't know, I'm messing with my camera now. There's a whip, here's a whiteboard. And this is analog model. Uh, this is my analog modeling system. And you see, there's a diagram. And uh, on it, at the top, you have non-Marxist. In the bottom, you have Marxist. And then on the left, you have feminist. And on the right, you have not feminist. And we can see that everyone's kind of pos positioned here and in different places. See? We have, uh, for example, Cubit down, down, far down on the towards Marxism, but it's kind of in between on the feminist, not feminist issue. Over, over here, we have Haraway, who's a dedicated uh, socialist feminist, as she describes herself. Yes. Up here, you see we have plant and land, and you see they are not Marxists. Yes, they see they see Marxism more or less as a, a yet another chauvinist sort of top down uh, descriptive system. See some of the others that are closer in the middle there. They're not centrists by any in any political sense, but they're they're more centrist in the sense of these commitments. And then at the top right, <laughs> for good reason, yeah, we have people like Peter Slotterdy. I think Kurt Svile is probably also there. He's the trans humanist man. And then Michelle Welbeck, the novelist who I've mentioned several times also. The the key feature of this diagram, I hope I'm not yelling into the mic. Uh, the key feature of this diagram is that everyone on it takes seriously the singularity and its crisis. They they simply disagree about its nature and what are the most effective tools for like, mitigating its consequences. And I'll snap a photo of that diagram and uh, I'll put it on the Moodle. So we, we can agree with... Uh, uh, plant even on some of the most extreme points, but definitely on the open software. Deep fake. Okay, I see a comment. Thank you, Emma. I'll address your comment in detail uh, after the uh, lecture is complete. So uh, certainly, we we agree, uh, and we adopt some aspects of gender acceleration, particularly this connection between. Uh, between open software and, and multipolarity. Again, to remind multipolarity is just to do with world powers. That is it's the idea that there, 
cannot be, in order for dialogue, there's geopolitical dialogue, let's say, to continue. There cannot be a single global power. It has to be contest of multiple global powers. So the, arg the argument is that cyber warfare is, is the way traditional warfare is bypassed and the sort of supremacy via strength and force, supremacy via force that has characterized, that characterizes 20th, 20th century, uh, no longer the case. This is crucial. So we adopt that. As for the rest, you know, she, there's some extreme positions, perhaps that we don't, or that we might. I think that some in the audience probably may question. I excerpt just a few quotes that are kind of leading up. We read one. The feminine becomes untethered from the reproductive logic of humanism. The female is no longer in the service of the male as a machine to produce the future, to produce offspring, to inherit the spoils of production, but rather the future produces itself faster than human beings are capable of. It's uh, reasonable enough. S seems almost inevitable. Uh, I mentioned Welbeck again. You know, he's a very unpopular, uh, accused of many, many horrible things, just like Nick Land, uh, you know, but he's uh, a keen observer of social reality in any case. And the book that I put on the Moodle, I'm looking for it right now on my shelf. The book that I put on the Moodle is called The Possibility of an Island. And anyway, it's about, it's a sci-fi and it's about the near future. And it's just about, uh, it's about the end of differential reproduction, basically, which means end of sex. At least the end of sex as a means of, of reproducing species. <clears throat> and it's pretty persuasive. Of course, he's an alarmist, you know, and he sees woke and uh, identity politic as a kind of way of accelerating this inevitability. And um, in this, he's very much in, in step with land and plans, except that for him, I mean, I, he would put the brakes on. Yeah. That's why he's in my diagram. That's why he's <laughs> on the far right, you know, with he's with Slaughter Dyke and many others in, in this way. He'd probably prefer. <laughs> to maintain the patriarchy, if you will. But anyway, he perceives the crisis. He perceives the situation accurately, which is why he's on the diagram. So like, this is a kind of extreme, to say that this is likely or inevitable is kind of extreme, but it's probably, it's proof. well, uh, but continuing, what else? <laughs> On the one hand, a rejection of fellow egocentrism. On the other hand, the affirmative desire of the body made virtual. The imminence of desire in the trans feminine body expresses itself as the sexual desire of the trans woman and the desire to be a woman, the desire for gender itself. It manifests in a coupling of technology and capital, desire being plugged into a different sort of productive matrix. So uh, even more, maybe. We might say, uh, we might not even object to a claim uh, such as this, and maybe going trans femme, becoming cam girl, siphoning money from the global north, <laughs> you know, or, or whatever. This is a revolutionary act, can be a revolutionary act. Why not? Yes, trans femme war machine, like that's the claim. And even this, why not? What about the rest? <laughs> you know, it goes on. This is a very interesting paper. <laughs> As above, so below. Kill all men, kill God. The acephalus sets free a process for smoothing the space on which parties of demons take flight out of heaven to spread their venomous seed into the black and hateful earth on the night side of Eden. And, you know, you read this part of the text. Some of you probably you read this part of the text. And you're like, oh, uh, oh. <laughs> or I mean, well, unexpected, maybe. Or, well, and it becomes very clear at the very end of this description of aphotic feminism as a satanic, specifically satanic exit of gender accelerationism uh, from God and masculinity. And if you saw on my diagram, you could maybe it would be a stupid diagram. See? on the top left corner of my not very clear diagram, you see that there's a satanic element even in the sort of far ends where plant and land are kind of going that direction, but so Alistair Crowley 
George Bataille is probably the most important connection here for Satanism and semiotics. There's some strong connections actually, and I will mention them in my semiosal lecture, and I'll go into more detail about something which Plant alluded to, which is the use of Kabbalah specifically as this bina separatism, as as she calls it, which is specific reading Kabbalah of of Hermetic Kabbalah, which is Western Kabbalah, as a means of this war machine becoming war machine. But what's a war machine? <laughs> so we might. So this is a very recent paper, and you could say it's at the very cutting edge of a, a long-standing movement, or you know, uh, let's say a, an assemblage of movements, to use Deleuze and Guattari's terms, uh, uh, which I chose specifically because of its timeliness and its recentness, uh, and because I figured you'd probably never heard of it, and because it's the most extreme possible example, but has some more well-known precedents, particularly in Deleuze and Guattari, which give my lecture the first part of its title regarding the, the war machine. Again, the claim from, from, uh, from Plant is that the trans femme person is a, this is a war machine, perhaps the ideal war machine. If you haven't read Deleuze and Guattari, I mean, if you never heard of them, this is probably not all that useful. But if you, you heard of them, even though you haven't read of them, read anything from them, then you know about Rhizome, which is the first chapter of, uh, or I say introduction, really, of the Thousand Plateaus, which is the second volume of Capitalism and Schizophrenia, first volume of which is anti Oedipus. It's sort of probably the most horrifying to, to many, to the traditionalists, let's say, most horrifying idea behind gender acceleration, accelerationism are indeed already here, uh, already an anti edifice It has to do with, um, well, the book is about deconstructing psychoanalysis, creating a new form of psychoanalysis called schizoanalysis. Its key characteristic being that the Oedipus complex no longer uh, serves the function, the organizing function that it does in Freudian psychoanalysis. For, further, that the nuclear family as a, a metaphor, a model, a the theater of the unconscious, as it's called, family structure itself is called in question in, in the descriptive system of psychoanalysis. But further, the anticipation is indeed made that the goal of schizoanalysis would be indeed to shatter the family, if you will, as a kind of organizer of the structure of, of society. Yes. So that idea is there. And Anti Oedipus is an extreme book. Uh, Nick Land read Deleuze and Guattari quite closely. And in his opinion, uh, Anti Oedipus is a superior book. Gazan Bastos, he says, is, takes a, a good step back away from the more radical innovations of Anti Oedipus. And I want to talk about Anti Oedipus, particularly War Machine, because I've, just, because I've been reading it recently. And, you know, I put it off a long time, actually. I was recommended this book by one of my most important teachers, Marianne Bailey, at the Evergreen State College, and she's kind of slammed it on the desk one day, right next to the Foucault's The Order of Things. And I picked up The Order of Things, and I made that the rest of my, all the way through my master's degree. But I never actually opened up, you know, I knew about Rhizome, but I never opened up Deleuze and Guattari because I just, I wanted to wait. And I, so I started it recently. But the interesting thing they say about Thousand Plateaus, and I guess this is one difference between it and anti Oedipus is that it's there are many itineraries uh, that is reading itineraries. You can kind of pick and choose, so the kind of nonlinear organization, I guess, in, in this book as compared to, as compared to anti Oedipus, which is I, it is a more academic book. There are some extreme passages, and there's some real vulgarity, which to to today's mentality is pretty, I mean, it's pretty tame, but, you know, the book is still kind of like analytically organized, follows a sort of a pretty detailed table of contents, I guess that's the main thing, There's a lot of detail on the table of contents, so you can, you know, you can map the structure of the argument in your mind, 
Whereas styles and black does isn't like that. <clears throat> and rhizome introduction is supposed to explain that. Rhizome is just a kind of biological structure. A non hierarchical biological structure that they use. It's an organic metaphor for for the war machine. The war machine is the kind of enactment of the rhizome and has a political function to unsettle the state apparatus. So transfem is a war machine as far as land and plant. There are many, many war machines, many kinds of war machines. And the war machine operates in smooth space. So the state apparatus controls striated space and tries to tries to striate space, tries to, to layer space, I guess. Yeah. And layers. To try to impose its rational conceptuality on an otherwise uh, continuous space, smooth space. War machine operates in smooth space and smooths the striated space of the state, at least ideally. You can see how some of these uh, organic and spatial metaphors, uh, geometrical metaphors, are already kind of useful, even already thinking about transfem. Even though perhaps Deleuze and Guattari weren't really already thinking about that. Who knows? Maybe they were. But you can think about a lot of stuff in these terms. And that's the idea with the nonlinear organization of, of Thousand Plateaus. Is uh, reading against the grain is the war machine reading. You know? That is, you're not trying to discern the, what they meant, what they intended. Instead, the text, they organize the text so as to yield a, a, a large, finite number of possible interpretations. And thus, you know, so when I'm reading Deleuze and Bhattari, I take their words and I put them in any, whatever direction I, I want to really. I do want to know what they were trying to say, but I also am keen to take it in any direction I want, in much in the same way that I think plants and land do. So in this last part of the talk, so I'll be, I think this is the last, I guess, two or three slides, two or three slides. Uh, I wanna talk about smooth space in, in application to my project. Uh, it's a project in the uh, International Semiotics Institute called Tatranska Semiotika, which I have uh, mentioned and which is in the video from my lecture in Nitra, in Nitra. I'm looking at the chat. Uh, the lecture in Nitra, which is in this playlist, uh, which and that that project Tatranska Semiotica has to do with mapping, uh, mapping particularly in the Tatras. The Tatras are just, you know, the mountains of Slovakia. So we'll take some quotes about a bit more about nomads. The war machine is like a nomad in, in the sense that it has no single home and is always on the move in in smooth space, I guess. And so we'll take a couple quotes about these interrelated ideas, also related to deterritorialization. The nomad is always deterritorializing the striated space and smoothing striated space, as, as erasing the points that that create the layers of striated space, of rationality, and, and smoothing them out again. As, and so I'm. I've taken to repurposing some of these metaphors in application to my mapping project, which is the Statramska Semiotica. So here's some of the quotes. Now, the, the occupant of, of striated space, that is the state space or uh, patriarchal space, let's say, is sedentary. Uh, in, the, in their view, motionless. The sedentary's relation with the earth is mediatized by something else, a property regime, a state, a state apparatus. With the nomad, on the contrary, it is deterritorialization that constitutes the relation to the earth to such a degree that the nomad re-territorializes on deterritorialization itself. It is the earth that deterritorializes itself in a way that provides the nomad with the territory. I hope you've already anticipated that I, well, you know, I'm talking about skiing now, yes? I'm talking about hiking in the mountains, and I'm desperate to find a way to uh, confer some uh, social commitment 
on my addiction to skiing. Yes, <laughs> I'm constantly doing that. So as you've noticed already in all of my lectures, yes. And so this is just yet another attempt to kind of glorify what it was otherwise it's just a completely indulgent and chauvinist activity is ski. Yes. But so when we talk about the earth re-territorializing itself and creating a new terrain, a new territory, we're talking about snow here. We're talking about avalanches, basically. But also just the following of the snow, it, it deterritorializes and re-territorializes itself every day. Well, not every day, but on a good day. <laughs> so the smooth space, I mean, obviously, so what snow does when it falls on the mountainside, mountainside's a rocky, sharp, uh, angular place. You know? Whereas this, the snow, when the snow comes down and it goes on the ground, on, on the rocks and such, it's smooth, yeah, pointless. It's a smooth space. And, and the skiers, the hikers, they're nomads. They're war machines. They're moving through the smooth space. And uh, as long as they're not paying for a lift ticket, see, if you pay for a lift ticket and you ride on their chairlifts, then you're in street space. You're in the state at rest. But if you're in the backcountry, not paying for a ski ticket, and your war machine. So we're moving on. We borrow some more metaphors from Deleuze and Guattari didn't talk about ski. Uh, metallurgy, metallurgy. So, so the nomad is also a metallurgist and he thinks metallurgy is a better, well, Deleuze and Guattari think metallurgy is a better metaphor for the activity of the nomad war machine than is uh, sculpting even, for example. It has to do with the elemental nature of metal and its solidity and so on. Anyway, I'll read the quote. In metallurgy, on the other hand, the operations are always astride the thresholds so that an energetic materiality overspills the prepared matter, qualitative deformation or transformation overspills the form. For example, quenching follows forging and takes place after the form has been fixed. Or to take another example, in molding, the metallurgist, in a sense, works inside the mold. Or again, steel that is smelted and molded later undergo undergoes a series of successive uh, decarbonations. And I like this idea too because it's about retroactivity, at least in my mind. So the, the nomad operating in smooth space and deterritorializing, this has to do with process and practice, uh, praxis. Yeah. Well, I mean, you can still. I have my thing here, yeah, my diagram, my dissertation. I'm not going to talk about it right now, but I'm interested in retroactivity. Here. And so the different directions of activity and, and retroactivity. And the argument basically from Deleuze and Guattari, who also referred to Helmslev, is that the nomad works retroactively, retroactively. Yeah, I'll talk about it as semi also So you can understand all this stuff in terms of linguistics, depending on the breadth of your linguistics. So about, that's what's meant here, I guess, retroactivity here, starting not from a form, but rather from a substance. Yes, starting from the substance. Earlier, they used the example from, uh, from sculpture, starting from stone and carving your way in, working from the substance instead of starting from a template. Yeah, finding your inspiration from the stone, from the substance. So I, I read the next part of the quote. He does not extract the affirmation of a determined ideal from form. He extracts it rough from formlessness, according to the dictates of the forms. He utilizes the indentations and accidents of the rock. So there is an aspect to this uh, deterritorialized smooth space, which would, which necessitates uh, ret retro retroactive or uh, retroactivity. Let's, let's say. And metallurgy is the chosen uh, metaphor by Deleuze and Guattari for, for this act, the act of the nomad war machine, the metallurgic act of the, the, the nomad war machine. So to connect this, as I mentioned, to connect it to Tatranska Semiotica, which is a project I initiated uh, more or less in, I guess, in December. Uh, at this talk in, in, in Nitra. Let's see here, I, I covered the, the general principles and then went on to, and the main topic of the talk is about analog modeling, I guess. Yeah, and so 
you know, so Deleuze and Guattari, they talk about war machine versus state apparatus. They talk about a lot of stuff, but as I mentioned, you can also talk about these oppositions in terms of linguistics. And so, and they know this, they choose new metaphors, but you can talk about this opposition between nomad and state apparatus also as an opposition between communication, which is the circular sphere, which is related to process and signification, which is the inner square, which is static and related to form or structure, yeah, if you will. We could prefer war machine and state apparatus. This is also the, the difference between analog and, and, and digital model, I guess you, you could say. These, I'm, I'm cutting in broad strokes. I'm painting in broad strokes here, you, say, you can say, but so communication, signification, war machine, state apparatus, uh, analog, digital model, analog, digital model. So my paper was kind of about analog modeling in, in a sense of mapping as analog modeling. Maps also involve digital components, they, they can. But analog mo analog modeling has to do with diagrams, yes, and spatial or visual uh, diagram transformations, and the creative reasoning that the spaces and diagrams make possible, the creativity that diagrams afford. So analog model. My argument is that the movement in the smooth space that uh, Deleuze and Guattari, the movement of the war machine, is as also kind of analog model. Yeah. Now, the, the mountain only re-territorializes itself if it's actually snowing, yeah. And it's not snowing here anymore, sadly. No snow here anymore, my friends. But my friends over in North America are getting a lot of snow. There's a huge snow, storm cycle happening, or, or it's been happening for like a week. It's it's crazy. We don't know what's happening with the weather, but... So they're sending me photos. In the early season, I was sending them photos because it was snowing real heavy in the Tatras and I was having a lot of fun up there and I was sending them all the little selfies and they pissed them off, you know, because they were having a bad early season. They didn't have any snow. And so it was hard for them to live vicariously for me. But so now the tables have turned and they're getting all the snow and they're sending me photos. So they're, they're the ones who are gloating now. And but, yeah, of course, at first I'm like, motherfucker, but... Then I thought about it, thought about it, texted him, was like, you know, actually, uh, from my deresonated cyborg perspective, what difference does it make who who is doing the skiing? <laughs> or where where the skiing's happening? That's the point though, isn't it? That's Harway's point anyway. But so there, my friends are here in North America. Uh, this is the West. <laughs> and then we're in Oregon here. Yeah. And they're down here. One of them lives in Portland. Other one is Ski Patrol, director of Ski Patrol at Ski Bowl, which is here. This is the land of Yankees. Yes. And, and get a little closer. This is a satellite image of Hood. I'm not sure how recently it's been refreshed. And so uh, my friend is a director of Ski Patrol here. Uh, you can see here, like, this is another ski resort right here. Uh, you can see, by the way, that the lines have cut from the trees. And that's where he's director. But here is Timberline, and here is Mountain Hood Meadows. I used to ski at Timberline every 4th of July with my father and my sister. Uh, so places dear to my heart. Uh, and they, so there's been snow. Mountain Hood's a huge mountain, and it's, it's really high. It's like 13,000 feet, I think, which is about... Uh, 4,000 meters, a little less than 4,000 meters, I think. So they got a lot of snow down there right now, and I'm kind of hella jelly. But they're sending me photos, and I'm living vicariously through them. Uh, this is Ski Bowl. That's a photo on my wall. It's right next to my computer. And here we are. But the important thing about maps, this is something we learn about maps, is that we think that they present an iconicity relation, mostly, that is the similarity of the mountain to the actual mountain, to its object. It's, it's the way that the representation takes place in our minds. You know, we like extrapolate from the, from the similarities. But the truth is that if we don't have any experience, personal experience with mountains or similar terrains, then when we look at a map, we don't actually see the same thing. So it's actually largely conventional. 
And this is an argument from Umberto Eco regarding the status of iconicity. It's a nice discussion. And, and the status of iconicity would be pretty important to maps as diagrams. That's why I bring it up a lot, actually. So there's some dispute because Frederick Stiernfeld's the man when it comes to maps as diagrams. But Umberto Eco's reading of the nature, well, I mean, Stiernfeld endorses the notion of iconism, the Persian iconism in a strong sense, yes. And Echo has problems with this, and so it would certainly change the notion of diagram mapping for Tatranska semiotica. But this is just a pedantic point. Still definitely recommend Frederick's book, Diagrammatology, if you're interested in semiotics of mapping. So, but yes, in order to have a sort of robust, uh, you know, mental projection, in order to use the map in the way that it's intended, that is, that is as a set of instructions, one must have a personal repertoire, uh, which one, you know, accumulates in person. Yeah, so that's why I'm showing you more photos of us. This is last summer at Skipo. That's Guy. He's my friend. And we're right there. So the big storm cycle uh, just came in. They've been sending me a bunch of photos. I'm super jealous. This photo is one. This is just from like two days ago. I can I encourage all my friends to think of themselves as as content creators, and uh, you know that's that's also one of the actually one of the most important parts of both Haraway and uh, Sadie Plant's vision is that the real difference is has to do with whether you're a content creator or a content consumer. A war machine is a content creator, I guess. That's the idea. Pretty lame conclusion, right? I know, but it's true. So I encourage my friends to be content creators too. So they try. Here's something. A uh, problem with this. So this is a. Uh, this is all from just the last few days, and my friend made it. And uh, he made some music with the AI too, which sucks. So I muted it. Here's the video. Yeah. <laughs> Smooth space, you see. He's a nomad war machine. <laughs> this is re territorializing. Well, so the whole region was re territorialized to fuck by this storm, right? into smooth space again, because it was like sad striated space for some time because there was no sound. Well, nice job, Nick. That's a great video, but it's really missing something. What is it missing? It's missing music, isn't it? Uh oh, my PowerPoint stopped. We're going back. It's missing music. And uh, so I'm real close to the end of my stupid lecture now about seeing and uh, so we're going to come back to uh, metaphor from from Deleuze and Guattari regarding metallurgy. Yes, regarding metallurgy and what is the proper strategy for for the war machine to articulate itself against uh, its created space. Remember, remember, people, because metal is the pure productivity of matter. Those who follow metal. Our producers of objects are excellent. They're the best content creators. Yeah, that's me. So this is my video. Mine's way better than next. Check it out. The noise are there on the land, wherever there forms a smooth space that gnaws and tends to grow in all directions. The nomads inhabit these places, they remain in them, and they themselves make them grow. For it has been established that the nomads make the desert no matter uh, that the nomads make the desert no less than they are made by it. They are vectors of deterritorialization. They add desert to desert, step to step by a series of local operations whose orientation and direction endlessly vary. The sand desert has not only oases, which are like fixed points, but also rhizomatic vegetation that is temporary and shifts location according to local rains, bringing changes in the direction of the crossings. 
The same terms are used to describe ice deserts and as sand deserts. There is no line separating earth and sky. There is no intermediate distance, no perspective or contour. Visibility is limited, and yet there is an extraordinarily fine topology that relies not on points or objects, but rather on hasieties, on sets of relations, winds, undulations of snow or sand, the song of the sand or the creaking of ice, the tactile qualities of both. It's a tactile space, or rather haptic, or sonorous, much more than a visual space. The variability of the polyvocality of directions is an essential feature of smooth spaces of the rhizome type, and it alters their pattern. Now, uh, if you're curious, what the, if you're curious where the band was in this band, they're called Dying Fetus. Uh, and I provided this music to my friends, and they're like, whoa, Tyler, this video is awesome, but like, What's up with that music and the, the band? What's up with the name of the band? And if it, it's not to be confused with the uh, infant annihilator, for example, but one thing to keep in mind is uh, at least they're pro choice. Yeah. I mean, they're allies, right? <laughs> Good. So next week, uh, next week is movie night. Um, it's this movie by uh, David Fincher director of Fight Club, familiar. Another one of my favorites, Big Shocker, right? Yeah. Uh, it's Hollywood for sure, but I think, I really think that it captures something special about the singularity. I think it does. And uh, um, Trent Reznor does the soundtrack on the topic of uh, open software. Trent Reznor has been a huge pioneer in that area, so it's a great soundtrack. Uh, one last word about the Sadie Plant text. Well, it seems to me that this uh, the connecting connecting feminism with with Satanism. I see I see the argument, but it is also possibly itself a kind of mind virus, a kind of self accelerating thought that can be quite destructive. So it's possible that this text is a very hateful text, uh, but I don't know. It depends on how you read it. So I'm going to be pretty interested to hear what any of you have to say about that. But uh, the last word, of course, is from maybe the last word is from David Fincher. Don't forget, friends, you don't get to 500 friends without making a few enemies.